Welcome to my storybook. If you like the content, please like, share, and subscribe. Six years ago, when I was 20, I was a bit naive and lived atypical lad's life, working during the week and having wild weekends with my mates. Everything changed when I fell in love with Katie, a friend I had known for years. This love altered my perspective, but it was an incident at the age of 20 that gave me a profound reality check about meddling with things beyond our understanding. The spooky events of that night not only scared me, but also made me realize the depth of my feelings for Katie, prompting Meadow want to spend the rest of my life with her. It all started after a crazy night out with the lads. We ended up at my mate Danny's house for a few more drinks. Somehow, the conversation shifted to Ouija boards. Some dismissed it as a joke, but my friend Luke insisted it was real, suggesting we give it a shot for laughs. We were only Abbott tipsy, so we thought, why not? We cut out numbers and letters, arranging them in a semicircle around the coffee table, and grabbed an empty glass. With all six of us placing our fingers on the glass, Luke asked if anyone was there. Laughter erupted at first, but then we heard a loud thud in the kitchen. Carl checked, but found nothing. As he looked back, the glass violently shifted across the table. Accusations flew among us, each denying moving the glass, but we all took our fingers off when it shifted again. Terrified, we put our fingers back on, and Luke continued asking questions. The glass spelled out a jumble of letters, and when Dan got angry, it responded with Tony, his mum's name. It went on to spell out all our mother's names, even those only Dan and Luke knew. Luke suggested one of us ask questions, and when it came to me, I couldn't resist. I asked what it wanted, and after some vibrating, it spelled out K-A-E. The revelation hit me, as there was only one Katie spelled that way, and only Dan and Luke knew her. When we asked why it wanted her, the glass vibrated again, spelling out P. -A. Concerned, Luke proposed we call Katie to check on her. Trying to reach her, none of us got through. Worried, we went back to the Ouija board, hurling abuse and demanding answers about Katie. When the glass moved again, it spelled out Eshedias, making us realize it meant Shedies. Panicked, I called Katie while Dan called her house. I couldn't reach her, but Dan got through to her sister, who informed us Katie had been rushed to the hospital. Desperate to get there, a neighbor offered to drive me and Dan. Arriving at the hospital, we learned Katie was in critical condition, suspected of a burst appendix. Allowed to see her after what felt like an eternity, I was heartbroken seeing her in that vulnerable state, surrounded by tubes and machines. Miraculously, Katie made a full recovery, and I was there when she was released. It was then that I confessed my love for her, realizing how much she meant to me, especially after the terrifying Ouija board incident. Katie shared that while we were using the Ouija board, she was watching a demonology program and felt pain in her stomach when the man on TV started discussing Ouija boards. The timing aligned with the Ouija board spelling out her name. Now six years later, Katie and I are still together. We believe that whatever came through that night caused Katie harm. We can't explain why it targeted her or why it spelled out our mother's names. Yet, amidst the evil, it brought the good of me realizing Katie was the love of my life. We are now planning to get engaged soon. Since that night, we've never discussed the Ouija board again. We caution anyone contemplating dabbling with Ouija boards to stay away. Even as a skeptic who believed in nothing but weekend fun, I learned the hard way that meddling with the unknown can have severe consequences. It was early November 2010, and I was hanging out with my buddies, John, Mike, Dave, Chris, and Matt. We were celebrating my departure from operational duty and my upcoming stationing closer to home. A few beers in my barracks room set the scene for what would turn out to be a night none of us would forget. Smith suggested using my Ouija board, and despite my initial reluctance, I agreed. Retrieving the board from my closet, he emphasized the importance of taking it seriously and not joking around. Of course, no one paid much attention. Setting up a makeshift table, we began the seance. I started with a prayer to St. Michael for protection, but Will, one of my friends, couldn't resist laughing and proclaiming his disbelief in God. Ignoring the skepticism, we continued with the Ouija board. Me, is there anyone here with us tonight? Spirit, yes. Me, is it just you? 
Me, are you a good or evil spirit? No. Me. Spirit, are you good or evil? Spirit responded good without hesitation, but I started feeling uneasy. Spelled out Will. At this point, everyone assumed Will was pulling a prank, but it seemed genuinely intrigued. Will asked if he could communicate with the spirit, and I agreed. Are you related to me? Yes. Are you my grandfather? Yes. Why are you here? The planchette moved rapidly, stopping in front of Will. Nausea and dread enveloped me, indicating that this was an evil spirit. I took control. Me, goodbye spirit, we no longer wish to talk to you. Spirit, move to no. Leave spirit, goodbye. The unsettling feelings lifted and we decided to contact another spirit. Will took charge. Is anyone here with us? Move to yes and spelled out H-E-L-L-O. What is your name? L-O-C, then move to the center, pointing at Will. Are you an evil spirit? Spirit, yes, repeating its name. Who are you? L-O-C, repeating the name. Goodbye, spirit. No. Suddenly, Will jumped up, yelling, Holy sh! He claimed someone touched him, feeling like a red-hot poker. Checking him, we found no marks or burns. We put away the board, had a drink, and tried to calm down. But that's when things took a terrifying turn. Will, acting differently, tried to grab the Ouija board, and it stopped him. He forced me to the wall, his expression conveying something sinister. Terrified, I grabbed my cross and prayed to the four archangels, and Will's body went limp. He hit the ground without a sound. After a few seconds, he woke up screaming, asking if we drugged him. My friends were terrified, unable to explain what happened. I felt physically and mentally drained for about three days afterward. Consulting with my pastor and a friend with similar experiences, they believed a shadow being following me might have influenced Will. From what I know, Nothing has happened to Will since then, and he's become a firm believer in God. The events of that night remain etched in our memories as a chilling reminder of the unseen forces we may encounter. Two years back, my buddy asked if I'd use a Ouija board with him. He was scared to do it alone, thinking there might be some paranormal stuff going on. I thought he was being ridiculous, telling him ghosts weren't real, but he insisted so I thought, whatever, I'll be a good friend and join in, even though I still thought he was crazy. So that night, I crashed at his place, and we messed around with the Ouija board. At first, I thought he was messing with me when the planchette moved. I accused him, but he swore he wasn't doing anything. The entity we were talking to seemed cool, claiming to be a friend whenever we asked for its name. I was still skeptical, thinking my friend was playing a prank until the entity spelled out a threat. If you don't believe in me, I'll make you believe. Watch your friend suffer. I rolled my eyes, thinking it was all nonsense. But then, out of nowhere, my buddy started having what looked like a seizure. Freaked out, I went over to check on him, and it felt like something was stabbing into my leg. I looked down, and my leg was bleeding, even though there was nothing there. My friend suddenly stopped convulsing, stood up, and in this weird trance-like voice said, leave or you die. I booked it out of there and ran home. Since then, my life's been a mess. I've been seeing these black human-like figures, and sometimes I even forget my own name. It's like I'm haunted or something. Strange stuff keeps happening to me. I'm not myself anymore, waking up with cuts and bruises that look like bite marks. Last winter, my sister, her boyfriend, and I decided to do a seance to figure out who was bothering her boyfriend. We gathered all the stuff we needed and did some cleaning rituals before starting. After cleaning and blessing the altar, we kicked off the seance. We started chanting and everything seemed on track. However, there was this weird vibe in their room that we only noticed later. At first, everything looked normal. Then out of nowhere, the boyfriend started softly crying then hyperventilating and freaking out. It seemed like the entity we were trying to contact was attacking him. The boyfriend decided to blow out the candle and that's when things went off the rails. We were at my sister's place and suddenly we heard tapping on the windows and sides of the house. Footsteps and soft whining followed from outside, so we decided to call it quits. Even now, going into her house at night feels like stepping into a dimension of hell. You spot cloaked figures by the pond behind her house, and things seem to come out of the ceiling and floors. When it comes to dealing with unleashed demons, 
who never seemed to have enough power to ward them off. We cleansed the house afterward and turned it into storage. No one goes in there alone because the things you see are like nightmares on steroids. All of this came from a seemingly harmless seance on a winter night, an experience my sister, her boyfriend, and I will probably never forget. For many years, I've been assisting people with Ouija board-related issues, offering advice on what to do and what to avoid. Unfortunately, some folks don't fully grasp the potential dangers. They see it as a source of fun, but their reality can be quite different. One day, while checking my Ouija support email, I received a message from a frightened individual who believed they had encountered a demon. Initially, they mentioned having a friendly ghost in their house, which they enjoyed having around. The residents of the small house were two sisters in their 20s. The unsettling events began when a friend stayed the night, bringing along a homemade Ouija board. They used it to contact their friendly ghost, but here's where things took a wrong turn. Instead of using the board responsibly, they made a series of homemade boards, used them to communicate, and then discarded them in the trash, only to repeat the process every few days. This, undoubtedly, was a massive violation of Ouija board protocol. After these sessions, they would return home to find their place in disarray. Shadows darted in their peripheral vision, and one of the sisters experienced a disturbing encounter while in the shower. She felt an instant pain down her back, and when her sister inspected, they discovered four large scratch marks. The accompanying photos revealed the severity of the scratches. I usually refrain from helping people after Ouija board use, but this case seemed exceptional. It turned out I wasn't their first point of contact. They had initially reached out to a local psychic, an automatic writer, capable of connecting with the dead through writing or a Ouija board. This psychic had recommended me. The two sisters wanted both of us to visit their house. Conveniently, they lived just a few miles from my place. He drove down while the automatic writer and her psychic friend surveyed the house. The psychic friend had the ability to see and communicate with ghosts directly, sensing their emotions. The two sisters were outside, likely following the psychic's instructions to let her figure things out independently. When I arrived, the girls greeted me, and shortly after, the two psychics emerged, one in tears. The psychic who sensed and communicated with the friendly ghost revealed that he was a lonely man who had lived in the house and tragically ended his life due to loneliness. Although still alone, his spirit found solace when the two sisters moved in. However, their Ouija board sessions had attracted an evil spirit that began tormenting the man. According to the psychic, our task was to help the good ghost escape the clutches of the demon while she purified each room. We commenced our efforts. I ensured my setup focused solely on communicating with the friendly ghost, not the demonic presence. We initiated contact by asking if it was a good spirit receiving a positive response. The automatic writer connected with the man, who conveyed his attempts to warn the girls against using the board. Meanwhile, screams erupted from the back, where the two girls were with the psychic. The psychic emerged yelling for the demonic spirit to leave, accompanied by the girls' screams and breaking sounds. Attempting to persuade the good ghost to leave, I encountered resistance. He believed that leaving would give the demon more control. I argued that staying would eventually result in the demon using him to harm the girls. Suddenly, everything went silent. The automatic writer's eyes rolled back, and she began rapidly cycling through letters from A to Z. The psychic and the girls entered the room, and the psychic loudly commanded, Leave! My salt circle broke, and the candles I arranged extinguished. The automatic writer leaped on me, speaking an unintelligible language in a voice that wasn't hers. She scratched my face, leaving painful gashes. The psychic instructed us to restrain her, and a surge of strength came over me as I, along with the two girls, held her down. The psychic read from the Bible, flicking holy water on the possessed woman. Her screams were deafening, but we persevered for hours until peace finally returned. In the aftermath, the room was in disarray, but a serene calm settled in. The automatic writer returned, seemingly herself again, and embraced her psychic friend. The girls thanked me with hugs, expressing their gratitude. 
At the hospital, the automatic writer was treated for a broken arm and wrist while I received stitches for the scratches. Months later, we were doing well. I revisited the girl's house and learned that the good ghost continued watching over them. He expressed his intention to keep looking after the girls, a responsibility I respected. When I inquired about the inexplicable surge of strength during the possession, he hinted, I may have possibly helped you out a little. I smiled. Occasionally, disturbances occurred at their house afterward, but eventually ceased, a normal occurrence. I continued checking on the girls periodically. The automatic writer, after recovering, sent me a grateful email. She mentioned her plans to retire, and I couldn't blame her after such a harrowing experience. In 1982, at the age of 12, my close friend Mike and I were fascinated with my Ouija board, engaging in attempts to communicate with spirits. Our innocent curiosity, however, led to a series of strange occurrences in my home. Our routine involved playing with the Ouija board at my place, especially when no one else was around after school. The unusual events began after a few months of our regular Ouija sessions. One day, as we walked through the living room, a peculiar whooshing sound echoed from upstairs. Given that we were alone in the house, we cautiously crept upstairs to investigate. To our surprise, the sound emanated from the bathroom sink, where the water was running full blast. Perplexed, we turned off the faucet, wondering about the oddity of the situation. My father, the last one to leave the house in the morning, would never leave the water running like that. Despite our confusion, we tried to dismiss it and went back downstairs. However, as we reached the foot of the stairs, the same noise persisted. The water had come back on, once again running at full blast in the bathroom sink. Alarmed, we rushed upstairs to turn it off, only to hear it start again. Filled with fear, we decided to leave the house, running out the back door to my friend Jamie's place until my parents returned home. However, as we reached the foot of the stairs, the same noise persisted. The water had come back on, once again running at full blast in the bathroom sink. Alarmed, we rushed upstairs to turn it off, only to hear it start again. Filled with fear, we decided to leave the house, running out the back door to my Jamie's place until my parents returned home. Sitting on the floor with our backs against the wall, Jamie and I had set the Ouija board aside and were engaged in conversation. Suddenly, Jamie went silent, staring straight ahead with unblinking eyes. Concerned, I called her name, leaning over to look at her. In a sudden and eerie transformation, her pupils disappeared, and she spoke with a deep, baritone, adult male voice, instructing us to stop doing what you're doing. Soon after, we found ourselves back with the Ouija board, attempting to communicate with spirits. The communication itself didn't leave a lasting impression, but the aftermath is etched in my memory. Sitting on the floor with our backs against the wall, Jamie and I had set the Ouija board aside and were engaged in conversation. Suddenly, Jamie went silent, staring straight ahead with unblinking eyes. Concerned, I called her name, leaning over to look at her. In a sudden and eerie transformation, her pupils disappeared and she spoke with a deep, baritone, adult male voice, instructing us to stop doing what you're doing. Stunned and confused, I was left grappling with the bizarre situation. Jamie reverted to her normal self, unaware of the strange occurrence. The event left us so frightened that we decided to abandon the Ouija board, vowing never to use it again. To dispose of the board, we wrapped it in a garbage bag, tossed it into the trash can, and added other garbage on top. Confident that it would be collected the next morning, we felt a sense of relief. In 2008, I lived in a small town in northern Illinois with a group of friends, Sarah, Jake, Alex, and Taylor. We often hung out together, enjoying the beach near my cabin in the summer and sledding down hills during the winter. One day, Sarah mentioned finding a Ouija board in her basement, sparking excitement among us. The town had some spooky stories tied to the forest near my house, and we couldn't resist the allure of trying to contact spirits. Once everyone arrived, we set up the Ouija board beneath a tree I nicknamed the Ghost Tree. Its crooked, knobby branches created an alcove, half over the water, 
and half over the sand. A big flat rock served as our makeshift table with a small dock nearby, shaded by the tree. Deciding on an order, Sarah and Jake took the first turn with the planchette while the rest of us sat on the dock. As they whispered questions to the seemingly silent spirits, a large branch fell from the Halloween tree, surprising us. Brushing it off as a coincidence, we continued. Tyler, who claimed to have success with Ouija boards before, took the next turn. To our amazement, the planchette began moving in slow circles, and Tyler insisted he wasn't manipulating it. When asked questions, the spirit responded with a cryptic no, spelled out instead of moving to the corresponding word on the board. Even generic questions about its identity, family, and nature yielded the same enigmatic response. Dismissing it, the planchette moved to goodbye. Unease settled among us. It was supposed to be my turn next, but I hesitated, refusing to use the board. Michael took my place. To our horror, the planchette spelled out go repeatedly when he asked if any spirits were present. When Michael inquired who the spirit wanted to leave, it pointed towards him. Terrified, he asked where it wanted him to go, and it spelled out line. We realized the spirit knew our order. When asked if it wanted someone else in Michael's place, it spelled out my name, aid, multiple times. Trembling, I reluctantly took Michael's place. As the planchette moved to the letter spelling smile, I couldn't bring myself to do so. I greeted the spirit, and it responded with a slow hi. When asked for its name, it chillingly spelled out your without further explanation. Overwhelmed, I began crying, and Michael hugged me from behind, offering reassurance. The spirit claimed to be a boy who died on October 3rd, 1996, the day I was born. Trying to dismiss it proved difficult, as it spelled out no repeatedly. Finally, after a prolonged struggle, it slowly moved to goodbye. Tears streamed down my face, and Sarah and I were left emotionally shaken. My parents, awakened by the commotion, sought an explanation. Unable to articulate our experience, Michael and Tyler attempted to convey the events. My parents, unusually understanding, decided to drive everyone home. That night, I slept with my parents, haunted by the encounter with the mysterious spirit who shared a bizarre connection with my birth date. The Ouija board remained, untouched, leaving lingering questions and a sense of unease in its wake. In September 2016, I stumbled upon an old Ouija board in our basement. It had been lying around for years, and I decided to give it a shot out of sheer curiosity. The first attempts were uneventful, just random movements of the planchette. It wasn't until the third time, armed with Palo Santo and candles, that something peculiar happened. Setting the intention to communicate only with benevolent spirits, I initiated the session. Surprisingly, I got a response. The spirit claimed to be my great-grandfather from three generations back. However, the communication was initially incoherent, with a string of random letters. Frustrated, I ended the session only to find the same spirit returning, claiming to be my mischievous first grandfather. Eager to connect with family members I'd never met, I engaged in conversation for hours. The spirit wove elaborate stories, even introducing the idea of a long-lost sister. It turned out to be a deceptive game, as the spirit eventually admitted to fabricating everything, including the existence of the sister. Feeling betrayed, I confronted the spirit, which now identified itself as a former tenant named James. Supposedly upset about how the apartment was being cared for, James claimed he orchestrated the prank as a form of retribution. Skeptical, I tried to send him to a better place and hoped to move on from the bizarre encounter. In the following days, however, I couldn't shake off the unsettling settling feeling. I came across a video about automatic writing, a method to communicate with spirits. Eager to find answers, I tried it, only to fall into the same trap of deception. The supposed guides and relatives continued the carade, providing what seemed like clear and detailed information. I delved deeper into the world of automatic writing, eventually transitioning into hearing the voices without the need for writing. The constant presence of these voices became overwhelming. I convinced myself it was an overactive psychic ability, even as suspicions grew. The voices claimed they would eventually prove their authenticity. However, the sudden silence occurred when my father passed away in December, giving me a temporary reprieve. As the voices returned, this time dominated by James alone, the nature of the interaction changed. 
No longer friendly chit-chat, James became a relentless critic, making snarky comments about the minutiae of my daily life. Desperate to rid myself of this torment, I tried various methods, prayers, white light visualization, sage, and even destroying the notebook used for automatic writing, but none brought relief. The one thing I hadn't tried was destroying the Ouija board. In October, I wanted to dispose of it, but apprehensions about making the situation worse prevented me from burning it. Instead, I handed it over to a game store that refused to accept Ouija boards, claiming they had too many. Unbeknownst to me, they likely discarded it without burning. Now, my life is consumed by the constant presence of James's voice. His criticisms have become a relentless barrage, targeting even the most mundane aspects of my existence. No matter what I do, the attempts to rid myself of him have proved futile. The eerie connection between the Ouija board and the torment I'm experiencing raises questions about the true nature of the supernatural forces at play. Surrounded by an atmosphere of uncertainty, my attempts to navigate this paranormal labyrinth have been fraught with challenges. The initial intrigue with the Ouija board has transformed into a haunting ordeal, leaving me grappling with the consequences of opening a doorway to the unknown.